Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this Book at Lunchtime event on Prismatic Translation, edited by Professor Matthew Reynolds. My name is Philip Bullock, and I'm Director of TORCH, the Oxford Research Centre in the Humanities. I'm delighted to welcome Matthew today to speak about this book. Also on our panel are Marilyn Booth, Nicola Gardini, and Stefano Maria Evangelista, who will be chairing the discussion. Translation can be seen as producing a text in one language that will count as equivalent to a text in another. It can also be seen as a release of multiple signifying possibilities, as an opening of the source text to language in all its plurality. The essays in Matthew's volume explore prismatic modes of translation in ancient Egypt, contemporary Taiwan, 20th century Hungary, early modern India, and elsewhere. The book pays attention to experimental literary writing, to the politics of language, to the practices of scholarship, and to the multiplying possibilities created by it charges the recent, it charts, sorry, the recent growth of prismatic modes in Anglophone literary translation and translation of literature. And it offers a new theorization of the phenomenon and its antagonistic relationship to the channel view. Prismatic translation is an essential intervention in a rapidly changing field. In a moment, I'll hand over to Stefano, who will fully introduce the book and the rest of the panel. This will then be followed by a brief reading by Matthew himself. Afterwards, our commentators will present their thoughts of the book, coming, coming at it from their particular disciplines. We'll then give Matthew the chance to respond to some of the points raised before entering into what will, I'm sure, be a fascinating discussion. Our event will conclude with questions from you, the audience. So please do send in your questions via the YouTube live chat, via Twitter, or email them to torch at humanities.ox.ac.uk. It's an enormous pleasure, particularly at the moment, to be here to introduce the first ever online Book at Lunchtime, and the first this term, and the first indeed this term here. Book at Lunchtime is Torch's flagship event series, taking the form of fortnightly bite-sized book discussions with a range of commentators. Please do take a look at our website and our newsletter for a full programme for next coming term, and we'll announce details of that in due course. So all that remains for me to do is to thank you, the members of the audience, for coming along, for our panel, for their views that we'll hear shortly, and now to introduce our chair. Stefano Evangelista is Associate Professor of English Literature and Tutorial Fellow at Trinity College, Oxford. His research brings English literature into a dialogue with a number of other fields, classics, art history, modern European literature, and the history of sexuality. Stefano is currently completing a book entitled Citizens of Nowhere, Literary Cosmopolitanism in the British Fin de Siècle, due out next year with Oxford University Press. Together with Matthew Creasy, he was one of the conveners of the AHRC-funded network Decadence and Translation, which ran from 2018 to 2020. His current research projects include work on European Japonisme and the relationship between literature and colour at the turn of the 20th century. Stefano, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Philip. Um, so it is a pleasure to be here with you today. As Philip said, my job is to chair the discussion and first of all, um, introduce um, our panelists. But I want to give you, first of all, a sense of what's gonna happen over the next hour or so. So after my introductions, I will hand over to Matthew who will read from the book to give us a flavor of it um, and kind of to, to get us started as it were. Then I will call on on the panelists one by one, uh, including myself, and we will give uh, short responses to the book. Then there will be a short question and answer um, session with Matthew in which he will be able to respond to our responses, as it were, and, um, and, uh, and we'll be able to engage with him directly. And then um, the discussion will be open to questions from the audience. At that point, Philip will come back to moderate the final discussion. So without any more ado, uh, it is my pleasure to introduce, first of all, uh, the editor of uh, Prismatic Translation, the book that we're discussing today, Matthew Reynolds. Matthew is Professor of English and Comparative Criticism at Oxford, as well as being a Fellow of St. Anne's College. He chairs OCCT, the Oxford Comparative Criticism and Translation Research Centre, which is a TORCH programme, and he's also academic lead for Oxford's new master's degree in comparative literature and translation. The master's has grown out of OCCT's work and is just getting to the end of its first year. 
Matthew has written several academic books, including The Realms of Verse, The Poetry of Translation, Likenesses, and Translation, a very short introduction. He's also the author of a couple of novels, Designs for a Happy Home, and The World Was All Before Them. The book that we are discussing today, Prismatic Translation, emerges from an ongoing project of the same name, which has been funded by the AHRC as part of Oxford's research program in creative multilingualism. I'll introduce everybody um, now. So uh, the first uh, respondent, um, and the, the, the first respondent, yes, is, is Marilyn Booth. Marilyn is Al Saud Professor for the Study of the Contemporary Arab World at the Oriental Institute and Modern College here in Oxford. Um, recent scholarly books are Classes of Ladies of Cloistered Spaces, Writing Feminist History in Fin de Siècle Egypt, and migrating texts, circulating translations around the Ottoman Mediterranean. Uh, Marilyn is also a translator. She has translated many books of Arabic fiction, including recently, Joha al Harti Celestial Bodies, which won the 2019 Man Booker International Prize, as well as The Penguin's Song and No Road to Paradise, both by the Lebanese novelist Hassan Daoud. She is translating Huda Barakat's Voices of the Lost and uh, Joha El Hartis Naranja, Bitter Orange. Uh, finally, or last but not least, I should say, is Nicola Gardini. Nicola is Professor of Italian and Comparative Literature in the Oxford Faculty of Medieval and Modern Languages. Nicola's research interests lie mainly in the Renaissance, the classical tradition, and modern poetry. He is very active as a promoter of classical culture, and he is the author of numerous books, literary essays, novels, memoirs, poetry collections, as well as translations from Latin and English. His book, Long Live Latin, which was originally published in Italian in 2016, has become an international bestseller. Painting and drawing are part and parcel of Nicola's professional identity, which proudly bridges all separation between scholarly and creative work. We thank Nicola for joining us from Milan today. Okay, so I shall hand over to Matthew now, who will be reading to us from the book. Um, hi everyone, it's, it's, uh, it's great to be here to discuss the book and, uh, and also a little bit scary. Um, <clears throat> the first thing I want to reiterate is, um, as Philip said at the, the beginning, the book has many contributors writing about a very wide range of material, um, some of whom I, I, I hope are in the, in, in the audience and might um, join in with comments later. Um, so do check out who they are, the names are on the YouTube page and you can um, follow a link to see the, the table of contents of the book. The reason why we wanted to bring a great variety of different languages and language contexts together in one volume is that translation can be a very varied thing. It can look very different in different cultures, locations, moments and situations. So we wanted to represent that variety in the book. Um, and in framing the project, I wanted to come up with um, a fresh understanding of translation, a fresh theorization, really, that could um, account for, could join up, could account for all these different manifestations. So what I'm going to do now is just, just read a bit. I'm going to read the first page and a half or so of the book. It launches the volume, obviously. It doesn't go into to much detail, but we can explore further in discussion later. Translation breeds more translation. A novel that travels into one foreign market will typically spread to more. A news story when picked up by a global news agency will be reproduced in many languages. Films, TV shows, YouTube videos, Wikipedia entries and other kinds of media content are dubbed or translated not once, but again and again. A speech given in the European Parliament or United Nations is interpreted both directly and via relay translation into a multitude of tongues. Now this translational multiplicity is sometimes said to be a modern phenomenon and it's true that globalization and digital platforms have made the proliferative work of translation nearly swift and nearly visible. 
The translation's tendency to multiply both across and within languages has deep historical roots. Global news agencies began life in the 19th century. The reiterative translation of literary texts has a much longer history for it goes to the heart of what literature is. Works become literary classics by being interpreted and reinterpreted or in the theater performed and reperformed. And translation participates in this complex interplay of reverence and renewal, think of the global multiplication of Homer's and Shakespeare's. Religious texts such as Buddhist sutras or the Bible have similarly paradoxical histories of preservation through multiple change. And in predominantly oral and multilingual contexts where the standardizing influence of print is not present or not strongly felt, any repetition of any piece of language will involve alteration of voice, handwriting, spelling, idiom, dialect, language, so that verbal reiteration and translation cannot really be held apart. Often, different translations are done by different people working in different places and times. They can be taken as indexes of cultural diversity or historical development. But different translations can also be made by the same person. Indeed, the potential for multiplication is latent in any act of translation in the moment of its happening. In translingual conversation, any proffered interpretation is open to correction or rephrasing. In written translation, any chosen form of words is plucked from a cloud of alternatives. Any given translation in any form is just one among many actual and possible versions. Now in itself, each of the observations I've just made is uncontroversial. Separate aspects of translation's pluralizing force have been well recognized and studied. And in the book, I give um, a series of examples of that and, and pay tribute to the scholarly work that has explored these various phenomena. Yet, for all this varied and important work, the idea that translation is fundamentally multiplicatory, that its essence is not reproduction but proliferation, has been difficult to hold consistently in focus and to theorize. A paradigmatic scene of translation in which a single text is translated by one person out of one language into one other language is hard to shake off. It's rooted in dictionary definitions, according to which translation is the action or process of turning from one language into another, while a translation is the product of this, a version in a different language. That's from the OED, and, and in the book, I, I, I give a series of instances from dictionaries in other European languages. The same picture shadows the definitions even of thinkers who in other respects have reoriented translation theory. And here again, I explore the work of various, various theorists as examples. What would it mean to pluralize these definitions? To see translation not as fundamentally a single act involving one source text in one language and one translation text in one other language, which just happens to occur again and again, but rather as paradigmatically generating multiple texts. Translation's dominant metaphor would change. It would no longer be a channel between one language and another, but rather a prism. It would be seen as opening up the plural signifying potential of the source text and spreading it into multiple versions, each continuous with the source, though different from it, and related to all the other versions, though different from all of them too. And that's the end of my reading. <laughs> Great, thank you very much, Matthew, um, for, for introducing us to the book. We'll, I'm sure we'll come back to some of this idea in the course of the questions. So I'd like to hand over to Marilyn now for the first response. Okay. Thank you. Well, thank you, um, everyone, for being here. And I'm grateful to Torch and to Matthew and to everybody else for inviting me. Um, this is really a terrific book. Um, I found it um, both as a student, as a scholar of translation historically, for my own self and within the context of the Ottoman Empire, um, and as a working literary translator, I found it um, intellectually gripping and also inspiring. And what I want to do is just raise a couple of issues that to me, as I read, come up from the, the great multiplicity of work that is in this book. Um, and then if I have time, I'd like to um, finish a little bit more personally in terms of how this book does speak to me as both a scholar and a working translator. Um, 
Now, as we've already seen, there are a, a great variety of approaches as well as contexts that this book deals with. And one thing I really appreciated about it is that the various chapters enact, in many cases, the plural operations and effects that Matthew's opening um, preface and opening chapter um, introduce. So we see some of these proliferating um, operations in practice in the book. And I would also just note that there are some really fantastic literary texts. Um, I, I absolutely loved Philip Terry's reworking of, of Du Bellay um, in the context of the 21st century UK university. Um, highly recommend um, that as well as all the other chapters. So um, what I guess I wanna focus on is that is to say that in the volume, not only are contributors speaking about the prismatic as a way to approach translation, but they're actually offering a range of approaches or definitions or assumptions about what prismatic signifies. In a sense, I think what we have here is a sort of prismatic approach to the prismatic, if I can put it that way. So Matthew, um, as you've, you've heard, he's emphasizing in a sense, the operations and the products of translation and the the, what happens in and through translation and the vexed issue of how we think about or make visible the contingent and the multiple and the variable within um, acts of translation. Other chapters suggest other ways of thinking what, about the prismatic. So we find translation as a series of discrete acts entering through a prism historically as Yvonne Howell puts it on her um, really fascinating history of translation in Russia. Um, alternatively, we find the prism thought of as the deep or thick knowledge that ought to underlie any act of literary translation or, well, I shouldn't say any act, um, that does underlie uh, many acts of literary translation, but doesn't necessarily emerge in the end product. Um, in other words, and I'm thinking particularly here of Jean Anderson's extremely thoughtful chapter on translating a Tahitian writer into English. For Anderson, the translator herself becomes a what she calls a dispersive prism, but a prism that actually and then must hold back from displaying the prismatic within the translation for ethical reasons. So the prismatic for Anderson seems to inhere in the reading of both the original and the um, produced text itself. Um, elsewhere we find prismatic as a situation where very different political visions are generating different and perhaps conflicting translation outcomes within a synchronic cultural space. And again, I'm thinking of um, Yvonne's um, chapter on Russia and particularly what she says about contemporary Russia. Um, sometimes pr prismatic seems to be about traveling metaphors as for instance in Francesca's Orsini, Orsini's chapter. Sometimes it's about translating into and with um, different media, which is also just a really fascinating aspect of this collection, the, the number of media and sort of cross-media translation that we find. Um, so now of course, um, these different emphases can be mutually reinforcing and they certainly are not um, mutually exclusive. But sometimes I wonder if they might be a little bit at odds. Um, and again, I go back to Anderson's chapter where we have a prismatic understanding which actually seems to encourage reticence on the page rather than as, in a sense proliferation. Although um, Anderson is very careful to say that this needs to be an opacity that um, is um, that encourages prismatic readings on the part of the reader. So I guess my question is, I would be curious to know more about the kinds of discussions about the concept of prismatic um, that went on in the conference that led to this book and perhaps in the project of the book itself. Um, I'm not sure how I'm doing on time here. Do I have a couple more minutes? Yes, absolutely, a couple more minutes. Go for okay, it. great. Um, so then related to that, um, I come to, questions that arise for me as a working literary translator. And I think there are sort of concerns in the sense that if we think about the prismatic as a sign of creative multiplication, and we value that, and that's wonderful having that, um, that creativity and our work as, as creation celebrated, 
do we risk downplaying the material labor conditions under which literary translators work? Um, there are a lot of pressures, as I think probably everybody knows, um, that mitigate against foregrounding the prismatic when you're actually um, in, in the moment of, or in the many moments of doing a translation. So on the one hand, I think it's great, as I said, to highlight what we do as co-creation. We are co-creators, but we're not always co-reapers or co-speakers in the sense that our work is often in the end also um, not only made more channelistic, but, um, but sort of underplayed. For instance, one of the things that really bothers me is that still more often than not, um, translators' names are not on the covers of books, and I think they should be. Um, and, and so I think, now I don't wanna say that this aspect is absent from the volume. It, it is very much there, particularly um, Audrey Cousy's wonderful chapter on translating nonsense alphabets, where she talks about the process and how the prismatic is part of the, of the process. So it's, it's definitely there, but for instance, Cousy also talks about um, an inverted prism where the translator, the editor, the publisher, as she says, many subjectivities go into the production of one text, but in the end, it's that, um, it's that sort of inverted prism that becomes a channel. So I guess this leads me to think, um, Matthew, I would love to see a follow-up volume that thinks through the concept of the prismatic specifically from the perspective of the labor of the translator sure. and, and how that, and, and in a sense, I guess what I'm asking for or, or suggesting is that this would be another way in which to politicize the prismatic um, as a mode of translation. Um, I'm probably out of time. And so what I'm gonna do, um, I was gonna say a word about how um, my own work and how this, this book really, I think is, is going to impact on it immediately, which is wonderful. Um, instead of doing that, I'm just gonna finish with a very brief um, personal anecdote, which is last year, last spring, um, in the week leading up to the Man Booker announcement, um, there were of course a number of events that we had to participate in. Um, which was gratifying, but also terrifying, absolutely. And the first one was um, for translators. And it was wonderful to have our work highlighted. So we each read from our translation and then we had a discussion and it was great. But as I said, it was, it was difficult, especially since I really find reading my own translations after they've been published um, excruciating. Even though I think they're good, um, I just don't, I don't like looking at them again. Um, and so we, we got through this and we read and afterwards I was talking with other translators and I said, I'm feeling kind of uneasy because I was standing there reading from the published translation and I kept saying different words than those that were on the published page. Um, I couldn't help myself and everybody laughed and a couple of the others said, yeah, I did that too. So I think that's a prismatic moment and it just kind of shows you how inevitable and inescapable um, the prismatic is. So thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Marion. So Matthew, we'll, we'll hang on to the questions for a moment. And sure. uh, I will, uh, I've seen that you're scribbling as, as, as Marilyn was talking. I'll hand over to Nicola now for his own um, response. Nicola. <laughs> yes, thank, thank you very much. Just a few maybe sketchy prismatic remarks on, uh, on the book as I read it. Um, I mean, Marilyn has already been quite exhaustive on, on the, uh, the beautiful range of, uh, of theoretical, thematic, linguistic approaches. Maybe one uh, aspect I would like to, to add is the graphic appearance of the book. The book itself is a prism of, uh, of media or um, graphic <laughs> modes. Um, because it includes images, it includes different alphabets, it includes hieroglyphs, um, and and by by doing this, it's it's already showing the the, the wealth and the the limitlessness of of the material we we deal with when it comes to to translation. Indeed, the book is a wonderful display of varietas. Uh, um, while also being an admirable demonstration of scholarly rigor and passion. Uh, it's very hard to find such a wonderfully uh, passionate book um, in academia. Um, um, 
Now, uh, uh, it's full of, of results, it's full of questions, it's full of ideas and proposals, uh, it's full of research indeed. Um, but one obvious common trait is that of uh, uh, translation as a prismatic practice. Now, this is, uh, I, I believe, a, a wonderful uh, achievement because the, the prism metaphor uh, reverberates from the object under study that is translation itself to the practices of the studying subjects. Marilyn has already underlined this. So we could actually speak of prismatic criticism. This is a, a demonstration of, of, the, the, of the very method it, that is applied. The method speaks of itself. Um, and it invites us it, uh, to, 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 to use a multiplicity of approaches, um, to accept a multiplicity of theoretical assumptions. Um, and that's very refreshing uh, because it does away with any claim of universality or exhaustiveness, which, um, which has been a, pre a recurring preoccupation of um, translation studies over the centuries coming finally coming up with the way to retranslation once and for all and, and, and say what it is for everybody everywhere. Of course, in our post-colonial years, uh, this is impossible because now we are dealing with uh, languages, conditions, situations, political acts that are novel, that are unprecedented. And we finally indeed get to see translation from completely different and new angles. Uh, from before. Now, this prism metaphor is a highly liberating one. The focus shifts from result to process. And it is uh, on the process part that I would like to, to focus, uh, to, to, to dwell a bit now. <clears throat> if <clears throat> the process now is the core of the discourse, and not so much the end product, the results, the finalized and even published translation, well then all the principal notions that participate in translation, text, language, and meaning are subjected to radical revision. All oppositions, boundaries, and closures erode, and they give way to an expanding galaxy of refractions and in progress configurations. Now, I should like to suggest, and this is my question and suggestion at the same time, that yet another crucial notion besides text, language, and meaning comes in the picture. It's there, it's implied always, maybe it's not conceptualized independently enough. Um, Marilyn herself has alluded to it. And, uh, and I think that this other crucial notion, which in a second I will mention, uh, could beneficially become part of the prismatic discourse on prismatic translation. The role of the translator, the task of the translator. <clears throat> I say the role, but I, I very much should like to say the psychology of the translator. And I'm very grateful to Marilyn for bringing in a very psychological vocabulary, excruciating, terrifying, <laughs> difficult. Now, that's a topic myself. Uh, uh, that's a topic I myself am, I am very interested in as a translator, as a professional linguist, as someone who tries to practice different media uh, and codes. If translation is a process, the very protagonist of this process ceases to be one who believes in and struggles towards semantic completeness and cultural fullness. Once we are in a prismatic mindset, this is what I tell myself, all preoccupation with faithfulness and translatability or untranslatability become futile because it's no longer a matter of loss or gain. Such notions no longer regard the translator. He or she is caught in flux post and pre-verbal flux, post because this flux happens after the, 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 the text to be translated and before the text of translation. It's a space of absolute potentiality and it is 
flux which determines the translator's psychological posture. Now, there's one particular aspect of the translator's psychology I am particularly interested in, and that's pleasure. The pleasure of being in flux, the pleasure of being in the process. Now, you could describe this as anxiety producing, as terrifying. Um, well, ter terror actually happens, especially after publication. But, you know, indeed, we may uh, describe translations as an anxiety producing process. Nonetheless, anxiety itself can arguably be presented as some kind of pleasure, of jouissance. The, the jouissance of the precarious, the indulgence of the multiple, of the disorienting. Hmm? If all boundaries have stopped existing, we don't know which way to go. And, and that's exactly the, the psychological state I like to explore and to know more about from you. Um, and possibly I myself will, will write on later. So my questions are, why translate? What makes us want to translate? Well, in this picture, in this ideal second volume, which we all expect from you at this point, Matthew, um, um, uh, who's the translator? Why does he or she want to translate? And what happens to him or her as he or she translates? What's this will to <clears throat> translate? What's this pleasure of translation? Thank you very much. I hope I didn't take too much time. No, no, that's fine. Thank you very much, Nicola. That's that's perfect. So more more thoughts piling on, more very fundamental questions, right? That Matthew will have to uh, give answers to in uh, in in a moment. But first of all, just to, um, uh, to add my own thoughts to what has already been said, I, I'll, I'll keep them very brief. First of all, I just wanted to echo the. Um, how impressed I am by the the, the geographical and, uh, and linguistic etc variety um, of the book, the the range that it covers, also in terms of um, of um, of chronology, really. I mean, the essay span from ancient Egypt to the contemporary, um, which really um, kind of make it the product. Of, of, of collaboration, right? It's not a book that a single scholar could, could, have, could have achieved of, on, on her or, or his own. But setting aside for a moment the, the main theoretical un underpinning of the book, that is the concept of, um, of prismatic translation, I just wanted to say that for me, one of the most powerful uh, um, things to emerge from reading the book is that it really makes a case for um, that translation should become more mainstream within uh, uh, literary studies. Matthew and his contributors show that translation should not be um, regarded as a specialized branch of literature, um, but as crucial to what we do as both critics and readers. It may be that I say that because I work within a department of English where multilingualism, I'm sorry, where monolingualism is very much the, the, the norm and the assumption, uh, but this book shows uh, how wrong that assumption actually is. And just a couple of examples uh, of, of very well-known writers here within the English tradition, we have uh, um, Matthew's own uh, essay on, um, ex example, I should say, of, um, of Dryden, and Patrick Herson's example of Coleridge's Kubla Khan, one of the most famous poems in the language. Both of them show that what we tend to assume of as a stable uh, monolingual text on the page is actually the product of conversations, acts of crossing, of, uh, of dialogue that span different languages. Uh, but to start uh, briefly with the overarching idea of the volume, we've just heard, we've already heard uh, reactions to the concept of prismatic translations. Uh, as we've heard, this metaphor, the act of seeing translation as a prism, enables the authors to challenge a restrictive uh, but ingrained vocabulary that fixes on notions of equivalence, the act of you know, getting it right or wrong, capturing something adequately and transferring it with minimal loss or damage from one uh, language to the other. That's what the, um, the, the counter example, as it were, of the prism is the channel, um, which is also taken as a, as a metaphor in the book. Instead, translation unlocks a potential in the text, something that's already in it, it multiplies it, it ramifies it, it makes it plural. 
The prism is a cognitive metaphor, therefore, and not simply a metaphor for the materiality of the translated text. It is a metaphor for the whole, for the entire idea of translatability, as it were. Key uh, in this is a quotation from Charles Martindale, I think, that's actually used a couple of times in the course of the book and that I wanted to read out a, a kind of short version of it, right? Translation, he writes, translations determine what counts as being there in the first place. And good translations thus unlock for us compelling rereadings which we could not get in any other way. So this is from Charles Martindale's Redeeming the Text. Just again, translations determine what counts as being there in the first place, right? So Martindale is a theorist of classical receptions. What he's thinking about is the way that texts migrate across time, of course, how they kind of move from antiquity to the present and how through acts of rereading they become classics, as it were. But um, what, is, what is showing here is that every translator discovers something new about the classic. The classic is, is made out of the notion of accumulation that translation makes possible. Translations, he argues, are not just a vehicle for us to access the text, they determine what the text is. And I think that's a crucial insight, something that many of the essays in the book also um, demonstrate. So translations do not get it right or wrong, they constitute the very essence of the text as unstable object. And that instability, that flux, if you will, uh, to go back to something that Nicola was saying just before, is something that these essays really celebrate. Just a few kind of very quick snapshots of where I've seen this celebration has been particularly strong. Francesca Orsini's essay, a about early modern India. I think this example here is fascinating because uh, uh, she, um, she questions the lack of translation as it were, as a, as a, as a, as a formal activity in that particular place in that particular time by, by juxtaposing written literature to the oral and the manuscript tradition opening up as it were, um, the text, multiplying the idea of what the text is and, and discovering that translation happens in ways that are not necessarily bound to the text as an object. Similarly, uh, Matthew's own uh, example of Dryden, which I've already um, quoted, uh, shows how uh, Dryden was using um, uh, Italian and French sources when he was translating an English, uh, sorry, a, a Latin text, Virgil into English, and therefore that the, 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 the final product of translation is actually a product of a conversation between different languages and not just a process of transfer from one language to the other. And finally, the last two essays in the volumes haven't been mentioned so far. These are essays by Dennis Duncan and Stefan Villa, which end the book on a Borgesian note, as it were, focusing on pseudo translations and back translations, rather odd examples, as it were. All these instances in which translation is not something that happens to the text, but something that determines what the text is, right? You know, translation is inherent in the creative culture that um, produced it. Um, one of the most exciting things and revealing things about the book for me was the dialogue between translators, practicing translators and critics. And I thought that, you know, the argument really came alive when that dialogue was in a way played out on the page. And so I just want to cite as my final example here, um, the essay um, in the book by Pari Azar Motamedi on the contemporary Persian poet Shafi Katkani. Now, Motamedi is herself a practicing artist and she has translated some of Katkani's poems into paintings. And in fact, the, I'll, I'll show the cover of the book, if I may, for a moment, is one of her paintings, isn't it? So um, this, this, is, this is her work. Um, so it's really interesting to see in her essay how she enters a, into a conversation with uh, Clive Scott, who is a, a critic and, um, and a comparatist. And it really shows how translation becomes a bridge between theory and practice, as it were, a way of kind of creating a dialogue between uh, um, be between critics and, 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 and people who practice, as it were, uh, uh, literature. Um, this is important because uh, translation also has a very 
alive and social mission, of course, of promoting the knowledge of foreign literatures, of taking people to places that are outside their mother tongue and outside their boundaries of what they think they already know. So my, my, my question for Matthew is a question about collaboration. And I wondered if he could uh, tell us a little bit more about the, the, the role that translators have had in shaping the concept of prismatic translation. In a way, it kind of uh, hacks back to some of the things that Marilyn actually was saying, whether the, there was a resistance as it were, from translators to this concept of whether the, 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 the concept of the prism was something that harmoniously emerged from, from the dialogue. So these are my thoughts. So Matthew, back to you. Uh, I know I've seen that you've been taking notes. So you know, <laughs> uh, give us uh, you know, a, 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 a new journey as it were through the book, through your, through your thoughts now. Okay, brilliant. Thank you all so much. That was really thought provoking. I'm especially um, grateful for the suggestion that I do a whole new book now. Whoops. Um, sorry, I just uh, switched my screen off. There, okay, sorry. Um, yeah, the suggestion I do a whole new book now, I just kind of thought I had some time on my hands with so much, um, not much to do. So thank you for that. <laughs> um, yeah, going back, I want to start by um, going back to a point um, Marilyn raised at the beginning about the metaphor and how the metaphor works and how people take the metaphor differently. Um, so the idea here is, as, as Stefano pointed out, you, you know, saying that, okay, what we're, what we're looking at here is a cognitive um, metaphor, um, is that um, I, I got interested in the, the way people talk, the, the language we've got for talking about translation affects what it's possible to think about it. Um, and so one of the things, as soon as you, you watch people talking about translation, one of the things that keeps coming back is, is a kind of channel sort of language, that there's something, the language of equivalence is like this, there's something meaning can be transferred from one language to another. Um, and so by bringing in the metaphor of the prism, I wanted to say, okay, let's, let's bring in a different picture, let's bring in a different picture to affect our thoughts. But of course, a metaphor like that doesn't, you know, um, uh, doesn't isn't isn't sort of controlling it doesn't have meaning inscribed in it that the sense that people make of it what the metaphor comes to mean um is is is, is something that you know people can interpret it in different ways and um you know i was keen to, to to encourage that actually when the work on the book goes back to um 2015 i think and there was some sort of discussion what do you mean by the metaphor of the prism and i was very much sort of saying well okay let's explore what it what might mean for the different members of the project with the idea that you know the project is itself a kind of prismatic um, prismatic thing um, for, for me a, a, a crucial thing is to see and again Stefano gestured towards this when you were talking about um, what I say about Dryden is the idea that translations tr translators work among language so there's never just one text in play there are other versions, there are dictionaries, there are related texts that you have in mind, et cetera, so that there's a variety of language that kind of flows into the moment of translation, as well as a variety of possible versions that flows, flows out of it. But that's the sort of aspect of it that I, you know, matters to me more than to um, other contributors, um, other contributors um, in the book. Um, the next thing I suppose is about historical location and material work um, and here for me a really key thing is to see that translation comes before languages rather than the other way around so that I think a lot of thinking about translation the sort of common sense way of thinking about translation starts from the idea that here is one language over here and there's another language over there and translation is a, is, is a matter of moving from one language to this separate standardized language there is over, over there. But as soon as you broaden your view a bit and you look at the history of language and you look at how language is used, not even, you don't even need to look around the world, how language is used anywhere, language is used in very, very varied ways. Um, so the scenario in which there's a text in standard English that needs translating into standard French is actually a very unusual um, scenario when you sort of think about how people move between language difference in their lives in, in, in many different um, in many different um, contexts. So, so um, one of the things I'm, that, that's really sort of changed was a kind of light bulb moment for me a, a few years ago when I, when I sort of started to, to realize this, that if you see acts of translation as sort of participating as happening among language variety and translation as moving across language variety rather than as, you know, Move, jumping from one already established standard language to another already established standard language. Um, 
then that that immediately becomes also a very historically located thing because you can see that the work of translators goes into establishing what counts as the meaning of a word. It goes into establishing what counts as separation between between languages that then become standard standard languages. So that's um, something that that. That, that matters to me. For me, a key thing is to say, recognize, and, and this goes back actually to, to, to Stefano's point about translation being at the, at the heart of what it is to interpret and at the heart of what it is to encounter a, a, a literary text because language is always changing. Everyone is using language in different ways. And then when you're the, the sort of, the particular regimented instance of a, a standardized use of, use of language is sort of, is, is unusual within that larger landscape of ever shifting um, language variety. And actually something that, that arises from that, I just want to um, pay tribute to the, to, the, to the publisher of this book actually, and also to say something about collaboration because um, uh, yes, yeah, so, so, so one of the things, one, one of the things for me that I, I, I kind of often worry about is what shifts when you move from all the you move from sort of thinking about, experiencing, writing about the great inventiveness of language use that there is in, in, in all sorts of kinds of literary writing, but also all, all over the place. And when you try to talk about that in an academic context, in an academic book, when you have to use standardized, you know, academic English. Um, and so um, one of the things I wanted to do was to bring different kinds of writing together in the book. So to bring, you know, creative writing um, art, physical art, these kinds of things together in the book to get a sense of how you can sort of understand something not through the the, the standard, you know, the, the, the standardized form of the of, of the academic essay. But another thing actually is the, simply the material difficulty of representing different scripts. So I'm not sure. Um, so the publisher of this book is is Legenda, and I want to pay tribute to the to the managing editor Graham, who spent. You know, about a week, I think, trying to typeset the the, the 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 chapter with the hieroglyphs in it, and there aren't very many books where you have hieroglyphs, you have digital, you have coding, you have beautifully represented color paintings, um, you have Arabic, you have Hebrew, etc. All these scripts there together on the page, and that's a material thing about what it's difficult to do in publishing. Um, and I was, you know, so I'm, I'm one of the things I love about the book is that it has a great variety of different um, scripts and sort of kinds of meaning making um, happening on its, its pages. Um, the last thing I wanted to get to then, this, this comes back to the point Nicola and also uh, Marilyn, you raised about the sort of prismatic moment of reading out something that you've done and finding you want to use different words. And, and for me, the, the sort of, the, the moment that, that, that sort of, haunts me really in quite a lot of this work is when Dryden who did this you know amazing translation of the Aeneid and what he said about it was I've done great wrong to Virgil throughout the whole translation and so you've got this 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 sort of switch around in attitude on the one hand I'm really trying to do you know I'm really trying to do my best and trying to get the Aeneid over into English so that's an instance of a sort of channel way of thinking but as soon as you've done that you, you, you see how it could have been done differently um, and for me this is really key so for me you can't the sort of channel way of thinking the desire for equivalence the feeling that you really have understood the text and you can say something that represents the text it's really impossible to get away from that completely so for me, the really key thing about, about, about translations is they're these paradoxical sorts of texts in which on the one hand, um, you recognize that of course they're different from the source in all sorts of ways. But then on the other hand, you sort of desperately want them to be the same. Um, and you, we, know, we use them as being the same, we read them as though they were the same often. And you can't, for me, the, the way I think about it is you just, you can't get away from that. You can't get away from that paradox and that's, that's fundamentally a sort of paradox really also about what it is to try to understand. You want to feel that you've understood something, but at the same time, the version you're making of it is always different from what other versions, okay. um, what other versions could, 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 could be. Um, so um, I think I might have run out of things to say, but I mean, also part of the reason for that again is to do with is to do with time, it's to do with, with language change. So that something that strikes you as you know, the answer in one moment, it Absolutely. time moves on, your sense of where you are in language, your own language changes, et cetera, and different 
different understandings and different words offer themselves instead. I don't know if any of you want to. Yeah, no, Matthew, uh, also another good example would be uh, Elizabeth Barrett uh, from from whom you start uh, mm. and she translated and it's it's very nice you start from her for, from her example a woman translating from from the Greek from ancient Greek um, twice the same tragedy um, Prometheus bound and she herself feeling guilty um, for, for the wrong she did to to Aeschylus and uh, she speaks of a sin even. Now, um, I, as I suggested, pleasure is what I would like to speculate about and, and um, talk about possibly in, a, in, in an essay I, um, I'll be writing. But um, it's obvious from your examples that uh, there's a lot of displeasure there. There's a lot of, because uh, all translators, when they, when, where, when they are in the flux, they're actually trying to stop the flux. Yeah. and freeze it and they want to become eternal they want to make their translation eternal but but uh, the, the the temporal t translation is deeply temporal and mm -hmm. it's subjected to to decay um uh, it's it's a it's a drama the, the translator is is, a, is one of the most tragic figures we can think of somebody who's <laughs> who's a spy uh, dorian gray they aspire to eternity and they relapse on on mortality. Okay, so on this <laughs> decadent note, I think that we should probably um, call back Philip and uh, encourage him to um, feed us some questions from the audience. Of course, uh, Nicola and Marilyn stay there because uh, uh, hopefully there might be some more time for you to, to come back if you want to ask any other questions uh, uh, to Matthew. But Philip, um, well, feeding questions is very timely for a lunchtime discussion. Um, and thank you for the, the pleasurable conversation as well as the moments of an anxiety uh, engendered by translation. Um, one of the questions came in, which I think you've already answered. What can we do to encourage a greater appreciation of translators in the literary world? Well, I think books like this and conversations like this and, uh, are, are entirely a way to do it. Um, and we've had some very big questions like what are the major trends in translation studies over time and what are the greatest controversy around in, uh, controversies around literary texts in translation, which might take more than the 10 minutes remaining. Um, but one really uh, pointed uh, and, and rather nice question is, have you ever encountered translated texts that are arguably more beautiful, literary and effective in translation than in the original? And that could be thrown open to any of you, but perhaps Matthew, as you've had an oversight of this entire volume and have been living, breathing and eating translation for such a while, it might be one to begin with to you. Uh, yeah, it's the, um, yeah, there, there, are, there are lots of translated texts I, I love reading. Um, I, slightly, um, I slightly want to push back against the more than comparison, uh, because I don't think it's an either or, I don't think it's a competition. Um, and indeed, one of the things um, that a translated text can do is, is, is help you see things in the source text that you hadn't seen before. Um, so, um, yeah, I mean, there are lots of, so, I mean, actually the, 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 the sort of famous canonical poetry translations like Pope's Homer, like Dryden's Virgil, um, I love those, you know, they're fantastic texts. And actually one of the things I love about them um, is the feeling that they can, because they're moving between if you think about it, they, they exist in two different times at the same time, they exist in two different places, they move between languages and there's something about the particular kind of richness or displacedness of that imaginative world that I, um, that I, really, um, that I, really, that I really enjoy. Um, I don't know if my other people on the panel want to come in with recommend favourites. <laughs> um, it's hard, isn't it? But also, but also um, um, yeah, and, and another example actually, so for instance, Kieran Carson, so um, contemporary poet translation of, of, of Dante's Inferno. And it doesn't really make sense to say, okay, is it better or, or worse? But actually it's a, you know, it's a fantastic, you know, uh, vivid, sharp, perceptive piece of writing. And it's able to do what it's, what it's doing by virtue of being a, um, by, by virtue of being a, by virtue of being a translation. So I kind of, I'm really interested in the idea that translations can do things that other texts can't. And that's because of their complexity because of their um, secondary notes. Um, actually, I just want to say something about controversies and I, I just want to say the thing about, so one of the things people always say about translations is that um, 
um, translations are always different from their sources. Um, one of the things people say is that nothing can be translated. One of the things people say is that everything can be translated. Um, and just what I want to say about that is, for me, that's a kind of conflict between frames. That's a conflict between, as Nicola said, you know, the desire for it to be the same, the desire to kind of fix meaning, and the recognition of the endless flux of meaning that we're all caught up in. Um, and so, you know, in themselves, these these arguments are, are pointless. There's no point arguing about whether poetry is impossible to translate or whether poetry can be translated, etc. They're just different. That those. Um, utterances are just sort of occupying different positions in this paradoxical amalgam of the relationship between inevitable difference and the desire for sameness, which is what constitutes translation as translation, it seems to me. Um, yeah. Does anyone else want to come in on this question? <laughs> um, I suppose that raises uh, other questions that, have, that, that links to other questions that have come up about how one translates words that already have multiplicity built into them in one language, mm -hmm. the languages which then often, often don't have that. We often know that experience as learners of foreign languages that a word has multiple connotations already, even before it's translated, and how one captures some of that complexity and multiplicity and sort of inherent prismatic quality. Yeah, well, I think, so one of the, one of the, the sort of shift, one of the sort of things I think, the, the way in which sort of thinking about things prismatically is helpful, is that, you know, that seems like an insoluble problem if there's only going to be one translation. That's that's when it, it looks, you sort of think, ah, what do I do about this? But if you say, well, okay, actually, I'm going to, I'm, I'm going to try this word, I'm going to try that word, I'm going to try this other one. Um, so one of the, one of the things I, I enjoy, and that I hope, in a way, this book might help more people enjoy is the, the idea that, translational difference when you've got a variety of translations and they're different that's something to enjoy exploring rather than something to be worried about you, you don't look at that and say hang on which of them is right or which of them is better than the others um, the, the thing to do is to sort of explore and see what they've um, see what they've see what they've teased out of the of, of the source so so basically I mean as with you know when faced with something really tricky you, you know you do the best you can but also there's a kind of reassurance in recognizing that you can do it again differently or somebody else is going to do it again differently and there's going to be this 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 sort of as it were kind of pile, piling up this sort of in, ever, ever increasing uh, plurality that's going to going to flower out of um flower out of that moment yeah that's also linked to the question of the materiality of translation isn't mm. it that's something that the essays some of the essays also address for example how the digital kind of medium liberates or creates yeah. different possibilities for multiple meanings of translation being available to the reader in a way that the paper that book as it were can't because you know it's obviously you have to have one uh, uh one alternative and kind of fixate on that and the manuscript and the digital kind of offer ways out of, of of this yeah absolutely so so i mean one thing is it's easy on a website to have many different versions side by side but also there's the kind of mobility of so john Cayley has an essay about his um his 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 digital media artwork in which words are endlessly morphing into other words which 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 very much gives you that sense um the other thing i might just say though about this um this thing about okay a complex word in the source and this goes back to what marilyn what you were picking out about gene gene anderson's um, essay and the, the the thing I'd say there is that you we need to think about okay so here's the here's, here's the source text and here's the translated text but then that in its turn gets read so it's not as though the meaning of the translation is in the translation the translation is a text that is then as it were you know retranslated by its readers in different ways and so one of the again one of the sort of key emphases for me in the book is to see um, translation as, as part of an always ongoing process because all these texts, including the translated text, are always going to be reread and they're going to strike readers in different ways. Yeah, and if I could just add to that, I think one of the things that I always find um, both um, most fascinating but, but quite difficult sometimes when translating is um, when there's ambiguity or when you as a reader feel that there's ambiguity in the text that you're translating, you, you want to somehow preserve that ambiguity in the translation um, or, or, or at least leave those possibilities open and figure out a way again to open it up for the reader so that the reader can also do their own translation. And that's, I have to say, that's not something that editors always um, are very happy about, but um, um, I think it's, it can be quite, you know, quite important. 
Yeah. That's often happens with these live events. The questions are coming in thick and fast just as the clock is coming <laughs> down. Uh, uh, and there have been some wonderful questions about cultural differences and different attitudes to the status of translation globally. And we clearly hear, heard about some of the linguistic and, uh, um, and global range uh, represented in the book. Um, I suppose I'm going to offer you um, all uh, the last questions that's just come in. How does the prismatic approach um, and how might it, how might this prismatic approach to translation have an impact uh, on common perceptions amongst the public when it comes to translation and indeed industry practices? Um, and Marilyn, you've talked a little bit about those things. So is this a book, an intellectual exercise that, that will satisfy its contributors and readers? Or do you think there might be some political leverage at work in the intervention you're, you're seeking to make in the industry and in, in the readership? Well, I, 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 hope, I hope it helps people to be more open to the variety of translations, which is to say, when I'm going to read a translation, I'm not just looking at the best one. I might be interested in reading two, two translations of the same text, or I might be interested in buying three of them and jumping back and forth between them, which is to say, it pushes back against you know, the assumption that there's a correct translation or a best translation, and it offers ways of, ways of thinking about why you might want to to, to sort of um, why the why the difference between translations is something to to sort of you know enjoy and explore rather than be anxious about. If uh, Stefano, Marilyn, Nicola, you want to come in with thoughts or final concluding concluding reactions to anything we've discussed today. Well, I think yeah, just one brief um, um, remark on uh, on translation as uh, as a result of of many negotiations when it comes to you know professional translation. Um, we we translators do um, do our job, <laughs> but then uh, there there is there's a publishing house there which will dictate uh, conventions. Um, uh, and uh, and even aesthetic principles. So uh, and that in itself, it's um, I mean, in the end, you might not accept what they want you to do, and you're always you know the author of the translation. But uh, but the, the, that prismatic range starts even before you know the book. The book is obviously there for for any prismatic reception. And probably we don't know enough. People don't know enough about the complex technicalities of translation. That that also I think is something this wonderful volume makes our makes us more sensitive about. Marilyn? Yeah, I know I agree. I think this book, and I think also the um, the welcome sort of um, emergence of translation studies and the, the the really strong position it has now in the academy is really important in highlighting the work that translators do and not and as um, Nicola just said not just translators but editors um, and you know everybody else everything else that that goes into the translation so you know I just completely welcome that that's great. Excellent. Well, I think we've probably come to the end of our discussion. Um, I'd like to extend my thanks to Matthew, to Stefano, to Marilyn and to Nicola for being such an informative, enthusiastic, interdisciplinary, multilingual, globally minded panel for us. Thank you for giving us your time and your insights this lunchtime. Can I also extend my thanks to the whole Torch team who have been instrumental in supporting today's events online as indeed they are throughout the whole of the present moment. And my very personal thanks to them for everything they do to keep us in communication with our audiences. And thank you, of course, to the members of the audience out there for your time, for your attention, for your engagement and for your questions. I'm very sorry if we didn't get around to answering them directly, but I hope there were some thoughts there that uh, give you further inspiration, certainly for reading and buying translations, often multiply. We look forward to more Book at Lunchtime events, perhaps online and very optimistically in person one day when we can. For the time being, though, thank you very much and keep well. <laughs>